the power of genetic code. Information for each living thing, including humans. We set out to try this new method, and it worked so well. J. Craig Venter found tools to decode the 25,000 genes in the human genome and became one of the world's most famous biologists as a result. This is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. This was quest number three in the world of big science, right after the atom bomb and the moon landing. In the face of a world with cancer and heart disease, knowing this code has already reduced human suffering. Far from retirement, Craig Venter is not done yet. With the new tools in his scientific toolbox, he now has the health of the planet in his sights, seeking the key to our most urgent energy and climate challenges. His next destination, the sea. In the spirit of Charles Darwin's voyage of discovery nearly 200 years ago, Craig Venter is now crisscrossing the planet on board Sorcerer 2, seeking his own scientific breakthroughs. Join him in his attempt to change our planet's future by cracking the ocean code. Quest reaches beyond even the strangest life we've come to know, towards new nano life that has the power to produce clean burning hydrogen, to restore the atmospheric carbon balance, to predict the dramatic events of our world. These filters will capture this new nation of life, only knowable through its genetic code. Every milliliter of seawater has about a million bacteria and over 10 million viruses in it. We found 20,000 new proteins that metabolize hydrogen in one way or another. 20,000. These little creatures are less understood than distant galaxies, yet they form 60 to 90% of all life on our own home planet. They are the chemists in control of our planet's vital functions. The source of their power? their genetic code. Forty miles off the Maryland coast, a calm evening for December. We're releasing, so you want to go ahead and just pay out some slack? We're coming over on it, so we need to come around there. Sorcerer has stopped to lower the pump for the expedition's 13th sample. What's our speed? Good. Yeah, this will filter faster. The best chance for accumulating snows will be across the central part. Science technician Jeff Hoffman wants to finish filtering his first night catch of this two-year voyage before stormy weather hits. The cool temperatures will linger into early next week before a warm-up by Christmas Eve. This is an average haul. About two trillion creatures. It's time to get them below decks and into a freezer as the ship heads south throughout the night. Sorcerer is an unorthodox research vessel, but fitting for this voyage like no other. Oh, dolphins right in the bow, dolphins. There he is. Ahead, astern, and below is ocean life as we've always known it. From the biggest cetaceans to the sea turtles that migrate a thousand miles to the sea lions that can swim 25 miles per hour at a burst. Still smaller, we know the schooling fish, like these jacks. And even smaller, we know the gelatinous creatures and the tiny plankton at the base of the food chain. But below the tiny, towards the micro scale, is life we've only barely begun to reach. Our eyes can't see it in its native habitat, and studying it in the lab has been extremely difficult. What has been done in the past is people tried to grow things out of seawater, as an example, 
and the things that grew got characterized and the other 99% got ignored. That 99% is Craig's target. If we could see this life under the hull of Sorcerer, it would appear like a rich soup. Each individual about 1,000 times smaller than the tiniest fish. To collect these creatures, the ship has been customized for round-the-clock sampling of all the world's oceans. Seawater monitors, pumps, filters, and additional storage freezers have been installed. There's a global satellite information system for a full-time crew of six, plus collaborating scientists, and an onboard dry lab with a fluorescence microscope capable of magnifying water from each site 30 to 100 times and useful for creature counts. The scope helps the team enter the world of microorganisms. But the real work happens at the molecular level where DNA is read. That will be the challenge for the second part of this scientific expedition back at the J. Craig Venter Institute in Rockville, Maryland, within one of several laboratories staffed by over 200 scientists and technicians. The Institute's work is partly funded with multi-million dollar grants from the Gordon Moore Foundation and the United States Department of Energy. Craig and his team on Sorcerer collect the archaea and bacteria, together called microbes, as well as the viruses. The lab analyzes their genetic content, their genomes. Our genome is our complete set of genetic material. We think of it in terms of genes, Genes are a series of letters, maybe a thousand or so long in the genetic code, the ACs, Gs, and Ts that code for a protein. Proteins build the physical traits that give each living thing on Earth its function and identity. In a sense, genomes are life software code. Like code, genomes can be mapped. Besides the map of the human genome, hundreds of others have already been completed. Dog, mouse, and fruit fly, to name a few. The genes of less than 10 types of ocean microbes have been completely mapped. Off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, Sorcerer is now in the midst of the forecasted winter gale. With the storm over, a sample will be taken and filtered well into the night. So we started this leg of the expedition coming down the coast in what started out being strong winds and ended up being a full-blown gale. We're still dealing with the remnants of it. These forces can really churn up the water and bring up even subsurface organisms to the top, which could give us, again, tremendous diversity with the sample we just took. This is sample 14 of an expedition that began with a very promising pilot study in the Atlantic Sargasso Sea. Sampling continued through the Gulf of Maine and south along the American coast. And there are a lot of different ways to proceed with the science. We could have just sat in the Sargasso Sea and sampled for the next 30 years. But Craig's vision is describing global diversity of the microbial gene pool. With a protocol of one sample every 200 miles, he hopes to continue south to the Panama Canal. The crew will explore the waters of Cocos Island in the Eastern Pacific, then the Galapagos, the world's most famous natural laboratory for understanding the mechanism of life. A long passage across the South Pacific will take them to Australia, where they'll sample off the Great Barrier Reef. Then into the Indian Ocean, to the Seychelles, around Africa's Cape of Good Hope, and north through the Atlantic, to home. For the first time in history, we can work out the genetic code of any species. That allows us to work out the relationship of any species, including ourselves, to all other life forms on the planet. Our genetic code has many of the same genes found in other life forms whether that life is large or small, on land or in the sea. The connection is even deeper. Many of the genes in the human genome existed long before humans did. We're surrounded by a giant sea of genetic material by genes. 
maybe having as many as 10 to 20 billion different genes. When we sequenced the human genome, we found 26,000 genes in our genetic code. And people say that evolution is difficult to understand. But if our gene pool is 10 billion genes, ending up with 26,000 in our genetic code is not, doesn't seem so implausible. Darwin couldn't see them, the Challenger expedition couldn't see them. That material is going to help us understand the carbon cycle, just understanding the diversity of the life here. We're looking at things that Darwin couldn't even imagine. The sea has cast its spell on many restless mavericks. Once upon a time, these figures roamed the ocean seeking undiscovered land and distant treasure for their king. Their new knowledge upset empires, challenged popular beliefs, and steered the course of history into regions unimagined. The 1831 voyage of HMS Beagle took Charles Darwin to islands that opened his eyes to the secrets of evolution. 41 years later, HMS Challenger explored a novel destination, the ocean itself. Their discoveries changed our sense of the planet forever. The Challenger sampled 362 times. For each, they typically lowered three to five miles of stiff piano wire woven into hemp. At the end was a trawl, a dredge, a water bottle, and a sounding machine. After four years sailing around the world, they'd found the planet's deepest canyon and its mid-Atlantic ridge. They found 4,717 new species previously unseen. Many came from great depths, such as the exquisite deep sea glass sponge. Yet the smallest life that Challenger could detect was still 10 times larger than the biggest life forms that Craig Venter seeks. And his journey has just begun. The sampling of North America and the Caribbean is complete. Astern is the Atlantic, the second largest ocean on Earth. Ahead is the Pacific, the largest. And in between, one of the world's biological hotspots, home of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute on Boro, Colorado Island, and evolutionary biologist Biff Birmingham both from a terrestrial and a marine perspective, Panama's unusual. If you were to look at a 50 square kilometer patch anywhere else on Earth, you wouldn't have as much diversity as you see here. So we've got the marine diversity you find in the Caribbean, marine diversity you find in the Eastern Pacific, and then this extraordinary diversity sitting in between on the piece of land that connects South America to North America, the Isthmus of Panama. Our last sample was about 50 miles off the coast to make sure it wasn't contaminated by local pollution. We'll do a sample off of Coral, Colorado, and then we'll take some samples on the Pacific side. So we'll have a direct comparison of the Atlantic, uh, the Caribbean side, and the Pacific side. Craig has received an early observation from the lab regarding the first four sample sites sequenced. An incredible 85% of the DNA sequences from each site are unique to that part of the ocean. The sites are so specific and unique, we could probably tell from looking at the ballast water in a ship where in the world it took on that ballast water and where it dumped it. The implications are enormous. If you're taking a couple hundred thousand gallons of seawater, you're literally getting probably billions of organisms from one part of the world and then dumping them in another area that never had them before. Hey, how are you doing? How's it going? Want to come aboard? What about? Oh, yeah. So we got plenty of water in. What are these two yeah, greens got, down here? You got to pay no attention to them. Just go straight to the dock. And then we got the real pilot on yeah, Exactly. Board. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead and slack it. Go ahead and lower it. It's time to see what's in this Panamanian lake water. To take a sample, Sorcerer lowers a pump and a probe to a depth of about five feet. 
Hide the probes down. Instruments record pH, water salinity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen content, among other measurements. Every sailboat needs one of these, yeah. right? <laughs> well, you might start a trend here. That's how you After sucking in 53 gallons, the pump and probe are retrieved. The collected water is then run through a series of increasingly fine filters. The top shelf filters remove all life bigger than 3 microns. The middle shelf takes life bigger than 0.8 micron. The lower shelf, 0.1 micron. Those are organisms 1,000 times thinner than one human hair. 53 gallons takes about an hour to filter. Jeff Hoffman checks his catch, the first freshwater sample taken thus far on the voyage. Not surprisingly, given the tropical rainforest runoff, the 0.3 micron filter is almost choked with life. Like all of the 20 others Jeff has collected, the sample is then sealed, labeled, frozen, and made ready to be airlifted to the lab in Rockville. Far from the Panamanian sun, Jeff Hoffman's samples arrive at the Venter Institute. 59.1, 67.1, Wish you were here, Jeff. Samples have been arriving here for months, ever since Sorcerer's pilot collection from the Sargasso Sea. Those first samples are only now concluding an amazing journey in the laboratory. The lab work starts here, where each individual filter paper from Sorcerer could hold tens of thousands of unknown species. The challenge is to get inside the whole group of life caught by this paper, record its collective DNA, then try to isolate what each gene does. The team's method is called whole genome shotgun sequencing and an overview looks like this. The DNA is blown to bits and then copied so its code can be read by robots. A computer puts the code back together as we'll soon see. The approach was considered unworkable when Craig's team cracked the human code. Can it decode an entire marine environment with completely unknown species? The complexity amounts tremendously. With the human genome, we knew we had one species and one genome. Uh, we're dealing with uh, tens of thousands of species simultaneously. So how does whole genome shotgun sequencing work? First, a digestive enzyme like those in our stomach is added to the shredded filter strips in this container. With a little shaking, the enzyme will soon dissolve everything except for the purified code of life, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. The next step for the DNA is shotgunning with high-pressure nitrogen gas. There's lots of different ways to do it. You can just use shearing forces. We actually use small respiratory nebulizers. Propelled by pressurized gas, long stringy strands of raw DNA are forced towards a tiny pinhole nozzle. The long strands are sheared gently into thousands of smaller pieces. Each a tiny chemical ladder with rungs made of the four chemical codes of life, G, C, T, or A. The unique sequence of the letters on these rungs is the genetic code Craig seeks. But even the very best instruments are not sensitive enough to read every faint rung on a ladder all at once. So Craig's team uses some clever chemistry to break the problem into bite-sized bits. Every ladder piece is copied billions of times. Each copy has a very simple job. Get tagged and report back with the letter identity of just one rung of the original ladder piece. Here's how each copy tags its rung. A specialized enzyme splits the ladder. A second rebuilds it. The third and most powerful stops the rebuild at a random length and tags that rung with a fluorescent dye. All C's get one color, all T's another, and so on. 
Eventually, the billion copies have all been chemically resized and tagged. The next step is for each copy to report back in order from shortest to longest so that the sequence of the original piece can be recorded. That lineup and recording happens robotically in the sequencing core with 100 automated DNA analyzers, each two and a half times more efficient than those used to read the human genome. It gets loaded on the, the sequencing machines that separate uh, each fragment one letter of genetic code at a time. From each well of the sample tray, an electrical charge pulls all the copies of one ladder piece into a shielded glass capillary, part of an array where each tube is the width of a human hair. Inside each, the color-tagged copies begin to sort themselves by length. Shorter ones are pulled faster than longer ones. After an hour, they've reached the end of the array and the copies have lined up perfectly. They're straked with a laser beam. The colored identity tags fluoresce in the order they've arrived. A tiny TV camera then records each letter's identity in that order, that sequence, to a disk. From life to disk, What was once faint biochemical information of a living creature is now digital code ready for computer processing. Each row of colored blocks represents the genetic letters of one ladder piece. Craig and his team are getting closer. But the shotgunning created many pieces, like torn and scattered pages of a code book they must all be put back together and read. After all the shotgunning and copying, that's a lot of code. We'd do about 100 samples at the same time on each machine. With 100 machines, we generate literally millions of letters of genetic code every minute. This enormous volume of digital code is sent to the supercomputers elsewhere in the Venter lab. If you could travel inside them, you'd see an assembly for every 40 letter overlap. Many don't match, but some get longer and longer. Eventually, a complete gene is formed, a string of 600 to 1,200 letters in length. Genes common to all life forms are identified like gene rec A, responsible for repairing DNA, or gene 16S, responsible in part for building proteins. Since nearly every known life form has its own distinctive rec A gene, the computer count of this total is what everyone is watching. It will give a conservative estimate of how many new species the team has found. Every one of the 1800 microbes has several thousand genes. But how does Craig's team know which genes go with which microbes? Each genetic element, each chromosome, each species, each individual, the DNA is totally mathematically unique. And so it enables us to take the DNA out of two organisms at the same time, uh, get sequence of the small pieces, and when we assemble it in the computer, we can reconstruct those chromosomes. It doesn't mix and match. With 88% of the genes reassembled to some degree, Craig's team matches them letter by letter to the known genes of three sequenced and known marine microbes. This process shows that a mere 2% of what the team has found is familiar. The other 98% are truly new, but still similar enough to make a good guess about what they do. The production of hydrogen is coded by this family of genes, a tremendous prospect for clean energy. These genes code for over 800 new light sensors like those in our eyes, a big jump from the 12 known previously in marine microbes. A whole lot more photobiology appears to be happening at sea than we've known about. The first collection of data from the Sargasso Sea, I think is already, when it gets published, gonna blow people's minds. Altogether, an astounding 1.3 million new genes were found, almost doubling the complete repertoire of genes ever discovered. Anybody check the bridge height? 
The spirit and hopes of Sorcerer's crew are very high. They found more species in one sample area than Challenger found in its four-year voyage around the entire planet. To the microbial world. <laughs> You simply don't go out to a single site, describe the number of species that he's described, just based on their sequences, the number of new genes that he's described, and not have incredible expectations about what a 15 or 16 month cruise is gonna turn up in the way of new species, new genes, and more importantly than all, new ideas about what this all means. With so many new species of ocean microbes, there may be radical new understandings of how they regulate our planet's chemistry and we already know what they are capable of. Oh my gosh, there's actually some stuff. Microbiologist Claire Frazier. They can degrade the most toxic pollutants. They can synthesize the most potent antibiotics. Microbes can carry out chemical reactions that our best synthetic chemists are unable to do. Cocos Island off Costa Rica has a rich history of predation. I always try to avoid sharks when I'm uh, in the water, knowingly going in uh, with uh, this is the island of the sharks. Craig Venter is starting to wonder if the food we eat and the air we breathe might not come from the place we think. In a quiet bay of Cocos Island, 375 miles off the Costa Rican mainland, the Sorcerer Expedition prepares for diving and the sampling of ocean microorganisms. The Cocos Islands are notorious for uh, a variety of sharks, uh, big manta rays, uh, incredibly diverse fish and sea life, uh, all here because of the organisms that we're sampling. In part, they're at the bottom of the food chain, uh, the sharks and others at the top of the food chain. We're about full, so I'm going to cut the pump. All right. This would be my first time diving with sharks. Uh, at least knowingly. known it. The big eat the small, the small eat the tiny. This is the web of dependencies we've seen and we know. But it's below the tiny that our knowledge gets sketchier. The larger microscopic life has been studied by many from the Challenger Expedition trawls of 1872 through to the ongoing ocean chlorophyll studies from NASA's SeaWIF satellite program. Of the larger unseen life, the most important has been phytoplankton. These are the plants that are consumed by small animal grazers, triggering the food chain that continues right up to the apex predators, like this white-tipped reef shark resting between meals. Just like the rainforests, phytoplankton has been called the Earth's lungs. They inhale carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen. Each microscopic individual doesn't do much, but a trillion of them floating near the surface and loaded with the chlorophyll seen here as light blue and green are responsible for half the oxygen and carbon cycled by all plants on Earth. Throughout the world's oceans, they photosynthesize energy from the sun They've been the main source for Earth's food and air. Or so we've always thought. Now, the findings from Craig's voyage suggest that a trillion very different sun-hungry microbes could also be out there. They have at least 3,000 new strategies to sense sunlight. And they're processing that light in unusual ways. Without chlorophyll, for example. 10 to 20 percent of the Earth's biochemistry may not be what we've always thought. Hey, stand by to raise the probe. Craig is discovering a huge diversity of these microscopic chemists at every stop. 
With 25 sites sampled so far, his global survey of ocean microbes is already revealing their mind-blowing potential. Next stop, Galapagos, the world's most famous natural laboratory for understanding the mechanism of life. Here, Charles Darwin studied marine iguanas, tortoises, and a bird that came to be called Darwin's finch. He found convincing evidence of evolution and stirred deeply held beliefs so profoundly that the impacts ripple to this day. And now, Craig Venter visits this pristine ecosystem, swimming with Darwin's subjects and collecting life invisible to the instruments of the 1830s. Craig dives into the hot sulfuric seeps of the Galapagos on a global voyage of discovery that might impact you at your neighborhood filling station. The expedition prepares for its 35th sample, this time in a stiff two-knot current. Strange things from deep within the earth are happening under this rocky spire, and Craig Venter is here to investigate. The team is joined by biologist and collaborator, Dr. Victor Gallardo. Victor is trying to understand the source of ocean productivity in one of the world's richest fishing grounds further south, his native Chile. He suspects that phytoplankton is only part of the reason fish are so abundant there. Uh, it doesn't fit that only phytoplankton is responsible. So uh, there must have been, uh, there must be other organisms that contribute to the productivity. Victor is intrigued with the larger microorganisms of the sea floor and is participating in a 10-year census of global marine life. It's clear to him that Craig's voyage seeking the tiniest life is among the most important in ocean history. Uh, microbiology and oceanography are going to go forward tremendously by this effort, just as the Challenger expedition did in the 19th century. Sulfur was bubbling out of the bottom of the ocean, which is one of the major nutrients that feeds the microorganisms, that feeds everything else there. Normally you have to go down in a deep submersible to see that kind of sight, and we saw it in about 50 or 60 feet of water. It was quite a dive going down there, but it, actually experiencing that biology and putting my hand in the warm vents and taking the samples uh, directly, you know, it was a real connection to the biology. I can't wait to get those samples uh, back to the laboratory. So this was right out of the uh, vent, right in this area, was totally covered uh, with this white algae. It was warm, so I scooped this up with my hands. I felt it was warmer than everything else around. So uh, we'll see what's there. So Victor, this yeah. is our soil sample from the site. Right. And then we'll Below decks in Sorcerer's Dry Lab, Victor and team oceanographer Carla Heidelberg begin to look at the larger microorganisms from the sediment. And that has uh, all these creatures there. Yeah. While the crew in the Zodiac transfers the collected water to Sorcerer, preparing to filter the tiniest organisms. Smell it even stronger now as it's... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, wasn't easy to get, was it? No. It was tough up top, too. I mean, we had three people on the bottom pulling the hose towards the thing, and the surge would come, and all three of us go jerking across the bottom. Life is driven by the nutrients that are available, and so here it's sulfur. So most of these life forms are going to be sulfur driven. Not all discoveries have to wait until the genetic sequencing and analysis are complete. Sorcerer moves into the shelter of a nearby Galapagos hideaway for the night. The crew welcomes the coolness, and the stability helps the continuing microscopic work down below, where the largest samples from the hot seep are being examined. Wow. Um, what is the cyanobacterium doing there? There's sulfide and there's light. So it's a chemistry. Energy, 
Victor wants to know if energy is being captured by these tiny organisms, called cyanobacteria, with some mysterious new use of surface light, or if their energy is being captured from the sulfur, or both. How does this move? They, they move uh, by using uh, slime jets. The, the slime comes, comes out of this intercellular membrane all around the, the cell. The organisms have our factories to do all kinds of reactions. They have, uh, they have fantastic machinery. Like Craig and many, many other biologists, Victor hopes that the living mechanisms of microbes can address some of the energy and pollution problems the world faces. After all, it is the stored energy within life of many years ago that's become the fossil fuel reserves driving world economies today. A biological alternative to oil and natural gas has huge potential. Each year, the plant life on land captures and stores seven times more energy than is released in one year of burning fossil fuels. And ocean life certainly captures even more, though no one knows yet how much. There is no question that bioenergy will be cleaner and much quieter. On one of his trips back to the Venter Institute, Craig took the opportunity to test drive a hydrogen car and visit the first public hydrogen filling station in the United States. Right now, the production of this hydrogen is not a clean process. The U.S. Department of Energy hopes to change that and has supported the Venter Institute with $14 million to find genes that code for hydrogen producing proteins. The search is already yielding results. Craig's team has found over 50,000 different proteins in the environment that help metabolize hydrogen in one way or another. Back at the Venter Institute, we're trying to modify photosynthesis right now with oxygen insensitive hydrogenases so they don't get shut off by oxygen, which is what happens naturally in the environment, uh, to see if we can take sunlight and uh, get hydrogen gas bubbling off. In the future, each station could have its own hydrogen production tank out back, bubbling away hydrogen, much like bakers grow bread yeast. The team decides to venture into the interior of a Galapagos mangrove maze. Craig suspects that genes found in this area could hold new life codes that could improve the efficiency of producing another type of biofuel. I've never seen any animal. In These mangroves retain the residue from years of biology, and Craig is not the only one attracted here. You can okay, see forward. Buried up there with two other turtles behind. Yeah. See, right here. He's buried in the. Uh... You stay with. Okay, slow down. Slow down. That's a female right there, you can tell by the tail. We're right on top of the So the other guy didn't move. Okay, let's get the sample. The team will take both water and sediment samples here. I'm knee deep in muck. Oh man. I mean the number of low guys living in this have to be prehistoric billions and so I don't know if you can smell it. The sulfur pouring out. It's all this primitive metabolism. So there have to be a lot of cellulases and these bacteria things that break down the plant debris. Debris from corn in the United States is broken down with bacteria to produce 1.7 billion gallons of the biofuel called ethanol every year, often mixed with gas and sold as E85. Mm. 
Craig hopes that new microbial genes from this mangrove maze will vastly improve the efficiency of corn breakdown. The potential could make a difference. If the U.S. corn crop went to ethanol, 20% of the country's automotive fuel could be produced biologically. That's very shallow right here. With all those Preparing to depart the Galapagos, sorcerer stops for one last distinctive island sample, a pool within the island of Floriana. Long frequented by wading pink flamingos, this sample is a wild card because it is brackish and isolated. The potential is completely unknown. This is also an island that Charles Darwin visited. Greg Estes, a naturalist and historian, discusses Darwin's work here. Naturalists in those days, the way they made their name was to find something unique that had not been described before. And so when Darwin was, when he came to the Galapagos, that's... Today, on the anniversary of Darwin's birthday, Craig reflects on his own Galapagos stop. We based our world, and Darwin certainly based his world, on visual acuity. Now we have these new tools. Uh, observational biology is still what we're doing. We're just doing it with a different set of magnification and tools. We barely begun to understand biology on this planet. Maybe it's a little bit what it was like for Darwin having all these different species, all these different changes that he observed. Uh, maybe that's why it took him so many decades to really put all that together, is we're largely just overwhelmed by the information. The sorcerer continues its survey and collection protocol once every 200 miles. Australia is Craig Venter's third major continent with its mind-blowing Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest living ecosystem on the planet and has attracted world-class biologists for years. Much of their work happens at the Heron Island Research Station, operated by the University of Queensland. Doctors John Maddock and Linda Blackall brief Craig on their questions about ocean microbes and the ever-fascinating coral. Corals are famously frugal creatures. In clear tropical waters with little food, they've developed an incredible ability to extract every last bit of food available. Their secret? A little help from symbiotic algae that lives within its folds and grabs several spectrums of light energy from the sun via photosynthesis. Lesser-known third players behind the coral's team's success appear to be the even smaller bacterial microbes being sampled off Heron Island by Craig and Jeff Hoffman, All right, Karen. who's been on Sorcerer now for a year and a half. By squeezing that last bit of food out of floating waste created by coral, microbes are the ultimate recycling partner. Some types of microbes could also be the agents of underwater disease, releasing toxic sulfides that kill coral. Understanding the mechanism of underwater disease will be valuable knowledge for saving the planet's coral reefs. It's also critically important for the world's fish farmers and their vision of feeding the future from the sea. As Craig Venter turns towards home, his sample site count is now at 94 in building. Back in the lab, the number of new genes discovered through Galapagos is topping 5 million with 7,000 new species. The broad survey is already triggering new research by hundreds around the world in the ocean, earth, and biological sciences. We're going to learn more in this year and a half expedition about life on earth, about evolution of species, than we've collectively learned in all the time that science has been done up until this point. Right in through here. Charles Darwin's legacy is great, but ultimately he lacked the capacity to see 90% of the life on this planet. With his genetic tools, Craig Venter is now defining the next threshold of oceanography. A hundred years from now, we're gonna look back and go, wow, this was really a remarkable voyage. And from the sea, a new epoch 